hundreds of migrants arrive every day, already exhausted from their journey. Many with small children in tow. Many left their home countries years ago, looking for a better life. But now they believe it's time to try their luck at getting to the United States. The northward flow has all but stopped since last March when the pandemic hit. And most countries in Latin America still have COVID restrictions in place. But with a new American administration widely seen as welcoming all comers, the pressure to fill the human pipeline has become too great. And a pent-up surge of humanity is now again looking to make it to America's shores. Most migrants who join the well-publicized caravans start from Central America, but the pipeline starts much further south. People are coming from all across the globe, ostensibly fleeing violence and oppression. But they often pass through a dozen or so nonviolent countries on their way to the United States, like this Sikh man from India. India to Amsterdam, Amsterdam to Suriname, Suriname to by bus, uh, uh, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Ecuador to Colombia. In this group, we found migrants from Turkey, Nepal, India, and Africa, though the biggest number were from Haiti. That will require trekking through the forbidding Darien Gap between Colombia and Panama. I spent two days trying to catch up with some of these migrants as they traverse this very dangerous area without much success. I've been walking the Darien Gap Trail now for over an hour up and down these hills. It's incredibly hot. I feel like I've been standing in a warm shower. It's just kind of hard to even describe how miserable it is, and I'm unencumbered. Imagine being out here with a baby or pregnant or even in a wheelchair. I've seen all three of those things with the migrants in the last 24 hours. They're actually doing that, and it's because they have no idea. The smugglers that bring them through here lie to them about how long this is and how difficult this is, and that's why many of them end up dying along the way. I found this smuggler but he refused to take me to where the migrants were in the jungle. He said they are well cared for. They're privileged, and we never treated them badly. It's only four days to the camps in Panama. After two days of searching, I finally found the right place. But then I was immediately surrounded by angry smugglers. These migrants are starting their hike now, but the smugglers are telling me I can't go any further. They're telling me... I they tell me I can't can't go any further here, and they tell me I got to leave. They don't want me filming this. They obviously don't want this story coming out. So, entonces, está bien, está bien, está bien, está bien, está bien, está bien. Okay, okay, sí, está bien, está bien, está bien. Que está prendida, apaga, no grabes más. Apaga la que sé que está prendida, apaga. As the threats became more intense, it was clearly time to leave. So I caught a ride with a teenager on a motorbike. And that's when I realized why the smugglers don't want this story to get out. More than 10,000 migrants will likely pass through this tiny village this year. It's big business, which is why all the guides tend to have a brand new motorcycle. Well, Chuck Holton joins us now by Skype. And Chuck, tell us about the, the people that are trying to go through the Darien. And so both in terms of numbers and then where are they from? Well, Gordon, they're coming from all over the world. People tend to think of the caravans that are coming north into the United States as being simply from Central America. But that's not the case here. Do you have people coming from all over uh, in the Middle East, from Bangladesh, Indonesia, Nepal, Somalia, Congo, Ghana, Burkina Faso. We, we met people from all over the place that come up. And the reason they come through Central America is because they can get into Ecuador without a visa, and then they just start their, their trek north. But that in, includes going through that Darien Gap. And those people uh, just are, they have no idea how difficult it's going to be, and many of them end up dying along the way. They're saying now that it's about uh, 800 a week, and that's up from 800 a month before Joe Biden was uh, inaugurated. Well, what happens to them once they make it, finally make it to Panama? For those who do make it through the gap, uh, they are collected up by the Panamanian border police here in Panama. 
They're put into camps and then they go into what's called the control flow program. It's an agreement that Panama has with Costa Rica where Costa Rica will tell them how many they can afford to take at, at a time. So maybe 200 a, a, a every other day or something like that. Then they'll put them on a bus and they bus them north. See, none of these countries want the burden of these migrants in their own countries. And Panama is suffering greatly, uh, great cost to take care of these migrants that are coming in here illegally. So uh, they all keep passing the north like a hot potato. Uh, so Panama passes them to Costa Rica, Costa Rica passes them to Nicaragua, to Honduras, to Guatemala, to Mexico, and on and north to the United States. Well, there, there's got to be resentment in these governments for, for this kind of problem that uh, is being created. Um, what are they trying to do diplomatically to change it? The United States has put a lot of pressure on these various governments uh, down into South America. As I said in that piece, uh, these migrants, uh, they say they're fleeing violence and oppression, but they're passing through many countries along the way that are not violent and oppressive. And so they could theoretically stay in any of those countries. As a matter of fact, of this group that we met coming through the uh, Darien in Colombia, uh, most of them had already been outside of their country that they were fleeing for some number of years. And the only reason that they decided now to start moving north was because Joe Biden was president and they, they knew they could get a better deal in the United States. It is causing some resentment among the people of these countries because they see the burden that this takes. Uh, many of these, these migrants end up taking jobs away from local people. And so Uber drivers and taxi drivers and uh, farm workers and things like that end up holding protests in many of these Latin American countries uh, because the migrants are taking jobs away from them. And that's one of the reasons why the governments are so eager to get them moving north to get them out of their own countries. Uh, we have done a good job with Guatemala and Honduras getting them to try to stop the caravans, but not so much with these extracontinental migrants who come for other, from other countries around the world. All right, well, we've got a question from a viewer on Facebook. Leah says, I'm so sorry that their own countries aren't places where they can experience the freedoms and the things we take for granted every day. The amount of people who are risking their lives to come here is scary and sad. What can we do to help them, but also keep America safe? You know, that's a really good question, Gordon. And I think there's a good answer to that. In today's economy, with the internet, people can actually work in the United States without being in the United States. I'm a perfect example of that. I work all around the world, and I send my work to CBN in Virginia Beach, and I get paid for it. So the, the, the answer to this, I think, is something that a, a couple of friends of mine have done here in Panama. They're opening up education centers that are educating people in these countries to be able to do digital kinds of work, whether it's web design or graphics or virtual assistant uh, jobs, things like that, and teaching them how to do those and then helping them get jobs uh, with companies in the United States. And that way they can stay here. They can contribute to their own economies. They don't have to leave their families and they can still make a better living than they would be able to make as a laborer or something like that. Uh, you have to understand that everybody talks about the family separation, but the real family separation that's going on here is the people who are the, the fathers who are leaving their wives and children and moving north to the United States to try to make a little more money. And many of them never see their families again. They end up uh, stuck in the United States on an asylum claim for several years. And by the time that asylum claim comes around, they've already got a new girlfriend and a new family in the United States and their family's back in Guatemala or wherever are, or they, they, they stop hearing from them. They just disappear. All right. Well, Chuck, thanks for the insight. And thanks for joining us. Uh, and this is a lesson for all of us that how, how can we uh, enforce our borders? I, I keep saying what part of illegal immigrant, uh, that seems to be uh, a, a bad word to say now, but if you're a sovereign nation, you have to enforce your borders. You have to enforce your immigration laws. That's why they're on the books. Uh, so let's let's do that. Uh, when you have a 
we're open for business sign on your southern border. What, I mean, what, why are you surprised that there are now a masses of people lining up to come across? Well, if you want updates on this story and more CBN News, all you have to do is get the CBN News Channel app. Hello, I'm Gordon Robertson. Thanks for watching the video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more encouraging videos like this one. Welcome to the 700 Club Interactive Family, and God bless you.